This is Techno, a show about innovations that can change lives. The science of fighting a wildfire. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, but we're doing it in a unique way. This is a show about science by scientists. Let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. Kara Santa Maria is a science journalist and educator with a background in neurobiology. Tonight, don't try this at home. A controversial treatment. All right, I'm all rigged up. Some say zapping your brain with small amounts of electricity can make you smarter, cure depression, and more. I could feel prickly. Techno investigates TDCS. Is the evidence real? Erica, tell me how you feel now after finishing that TDCS session. Then, Dr. Shinny Samara is a mechanical engineer. Tonight, Shinny's selfie. So starting from the top, we look at the forehead. We work our way down to the brows. These scientists say they can guess your age and how long you'll live from a photo. What can you tell me about my future? Now, the techno team puts it to the test. <laughs> so how old are you? <laughs> Dr. Crystal Dilworth is a molecular neuroscientist. I'm Phil Torres, I'm an entomologist. Tonight, we're revealing all. That's our team, Go. now let's do some science. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm Phil Torres. Welcome to Techno. Joining me today, Dr. Crystal Durworth and Kara Santa Maria. Now, Crystal, would you zap your brain at home? Absolutely not, and I'm an expert. I just don't think that recreational brain experiments is a good idea. Kara, <laughs> tell us about this brain hack. Yeah, so there's a growing movement of DIYers that are doing just that, applying electrical stimulation to their brains. And researchers say it's probably not a good idea to do it at home, but there is a lot of promise in clinical trials. Let's take a look. How's that? Feels fine. Makes your hair look nice. <laughs> kind of like a deranged flapper. <laughs> All right. She's about to send a small jolt of electricity to her brain. When you're ready, flip it on. Okay. It's a DIY version of what's known as transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS for short. In research labs across the country, TDCS is being tested for a range of therapies. Everything from disorders like depression and epilepsy to brain injuries resulting from strokes and cerebral palsy. And people of all ages are trying it. But TDCS devices are seemingly easy to build and can be powered by a mere nine volt battery. This has inspired a growing movement of DIYers to make their own, using advice and instructions from the internet like this couple, Erica Muxlow and Jeff Veer. I was riding down the front straight of a racetrack on my, on my motorcycle. I ended up getting pushed by the wind and I grabbed the brakes, flipped it over, and I landed head first at about 120 miles per hour. So I had a really bad concussion. It's now been two years, and what kinds of symptoms were you experiencing that made you want to move forward and try out this new um, device? I felt like ever since my, my crash, I haven't quite gotten back to where I was. In my job, I've been um, a software developer, system administrator, a lot of things that take a lot of concentrated time in front of a computer, and I was finding that certain problems would be very frustrating for me. I want to explore some of the different configurations, uh, placements for the electrodes uh, to increase learning and memory. With about $60 in parts ordered online, Jeff built a TDCS device for Erica. I wanted to make her something that was all she wanted it to be, while also not wasting a bunch of money. The goal is to have it under two milliamps adjustable, so it's between 0.5 and two milliamps. I can, you know, take the leads and, and test them and make sure that we're getting the, the voltage that we expect, we're getting the, the amperage that we expect, so that way it's not so little that it does nothing and it's not too much that we fry any important mm -hmm. brain parts. So there we go, home-built TDCS. What does that feel like? 
that I'm getting a much better effect. I can feel prickly and I feel more alert. Erica told me she typically does TDCS for about 10 minutes a day while relaxing. Erica, tell me how you feel now after finishing that TDCS session. I feel alert, like I just woke up from a nice little nap. I feel more alert and I'm kind of ready to do stuff. When you first heard about TDCS, did it make you nervous at all to, you know, try and get involved in brain hacking in a DIY kind of way? Not at all. Really? Yeah, no. It seemed pretty straightforward. I mean, the, the currents we're talking about are so low. I mean, you know, low voltage, very low milliamps. To say that just, you know, passing a low level of current is, is automatically safe is just not true. Marone Bixen is a professor of biomedical engineering at City College of New York. It's great that it's simple, which makes it very deployable, which makes means that you can engineer carefully very safe devices. But it also makes people think that somehow any, anybody can do this uh, without any sort of control and, and kind of thought. He recently co-founded a company called Soterix, which manufactures TDCS devices for use in clinical trials. TDCS, as it's currently done in hospitals, in research centers, is considered very safe and very well tolerated. That is a very specific set of protocols. It's a very specific environment. It's a very specific set of devices. He showed me how his research team builds computer models to predict how current hits the brain. And what you're looking at here is what shows up actually at the brain. Warmer colors represent more current flow. And you can see here's one electrode, here's the other. The red square is the anode electrode, and the blue square is the cathode electrode. The simplest way to think about it is the anode is the positive terminal of the battery, and the cathode is the negative terminal of the battery, and your head is the circuit. When TDCS is applied in lab settings like this, it's typically no more than two milliamps of electricity, about the amount needed to power a small LED light bulb. The amount that actually reaches the cortex of the brain after passing through layers of skin, skull, fat, and cerebrospinal fluid is even smaller. So what the brain is being bathed in is actually a very, very low level of direct current flow passing along the neurons. The brain is super sensitive to electricity because the brain uses electricity. The neurons in the brain have a voltage across them. And for a neuron at rest, which is sort of like a neuron sitting around and doing nothing, that's around minus 80 millivolts. If that voltage starts to increase for some reason, and if it increases enough to what's called a threshold that might be around minus 60 millivolts, it on its own then makes a decision to fire an action potential. So instead of actually forcing a neuron to fire, you're just tweaking how much more input it needs, natural input it needs from the brain to fire on its own. That's a good way to put it. It took me 10 years of research to come to that. I figured this was the right place to try TDCS for the first time. All right, I'm all rigged up. I'm about to do transcranial direct stimulation in a controlled environment. So don't try this at home. All right, so I'm getting 1.5 milliamps of stimulation and I can definitely feel it on my skin. It's a little bit burny, prickly, um, kind of hot, and it kind of is itchy, like I want to scratch it, but I wouldn't say that it hurts. But I didn't experience anything else. Actually, for the low intensity that you got, mm -hmm. you wouldn't expect to feel like a new person or like you've achieved some sort of, you know, supernatural intelligence. No, I honestly don't feel any different. But researchers believe this barely noticeable amount of direct current can prime what's known as plasticity, the brain's natural ability to change. But if a system is already learning, if a system is already undergoing plasticity, TDCS can enhance that plasticity. What does TDCS do? What is it generally used for? It's almost surprising how broad the applications are. Um, so you're talking almost every neuropsychiatric disorder you might think of, let's say like schizophrenia or depression, and you're also talking about applications in cognitive enhancement. How do you respond to people who say that this is all snake oil? I've often used that analogy to snake oil myself. If I provided you something in a vial, and I said that that will help you with your depression, uh, it'll help your cousin with their epilepsy, it'll make your niece better at math, and it all comes in one vial, that 
because I'm making so many claims, it stops being believable. I mean, the simple answer to that is, you know, the TDCS is not one thing. It's not one thing in a vial. The way TDCS is made specific is by where we put the electrodes on the head and how we combine TDCS with training or with you know, behavioral therapy. Coming up, I put another kind of brain stimulation to the test. <laughs> right. So weird. It feels like you're flicking me in the head. Yeah. We want to hear what you think about these stories. Join the conversation by following us on Twitter and at aljazeera.com slash techno. I'm gonna just check the marks in your brain okay. before putting the electrodes, okay? Okay. In dozens of clinical trials around the world, a new technique called TDCS short for transcranial direct current stimulation, is being studied for its effects in treating a range of illnesses involving brain function. When people do TDCS, they will put the electrodes in different locations on the head, and that is very intentional. So for example, you might deliver it to motor regions if you're dealing with a population, let's say, that had a stroke. At Burke Rehabilitation Center, an ongoing study is testing to see if stroke patients can benefit. 78-year-old Marty Strix volunteered for the trial. During the brain stimulation portion, did you feel anything? Uh, there was a slight warmth, a little tingle, and that's about all. So you felt it on your skin, but did you feel anything inside your brain, inside your mind? No, I was looking for something like that, but no, it never happened. Patients undergo 20 minutes of TDCS, followed by robotic physical therapy. Instead of a human physical therapist, a robotic device is used to engage the patient's muscles, in this case by playing a kind of video game. And do you feel like the robot's doing a bit of that work? Whatever I can't do, then it you know, takes over and gets you there, but I, I try to do as much as I can on my own. Dr. Dylan Edwards is heading up the five-year study. If the robotics is done at a time when the brain is in a heightened state for plasticity, such as with the TDCS, then we think this, this is going to have more impact. The study is blind, meaning some patients get TDCS while others get a placebo, a sham stimulation. Do you feel like there was a significant difference before you started the trial versus after you did the trial? Yes, there was a distinct difference in the, the sensation and use of my arm. Really? The team at Burke also uses another type of brain stimulation called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. TMS is powered by a magnetic coil, and it's used by the team at Burke to measure changes to the brain after patients receive TDCS. So now we're gonna register your brain to the motion capture system. I will ask you now to put the... Um, yeah, let's put the earplugs yeah. in. Yeah. This is quite a getup. All right, so now when you tell me to do things, you have to yell a little bit. Okay, nice and relaxed. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Great. It's so weird. It feels like you're flicking me in the head. Yeah, so this time I'd like you to do a small muscle contraction. With the muscle contraction, what we are trying to do is to send a lot of information up to your brain. Okay. Don't get scared if your, if your hand twitches. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's the first time I really felt it. Excellent. That was a single pulse of magnetism. The shock itself is only about 100 microseconds or mm. so. So it's very, very short, but it causes activity in your brain that goes all the way down to your spinal cord and then out to your muscles. That little twitch of my finger was totally involuntary and caused by stimulating my brain. The team at Burke uses this technique to measure the muscle contraction and what's known as the motor evoked potential in the participating stroke patients. The hope is that those who receive TDCS will show a greater improvement than those who didn't. Do you feel different? I don't feel different, but Perfect. it definitely, I mean, you can feel it, especially compared to the, the TDCS. Right. This is a lot more intense. Right. So just to clarify, this is a lot different than TDCS, which doesn't lead to the twitching of muscles. Sure. Um, this is a diagnostic type probe rather than a treatment. The Burke Stroke Study will be completed at the end of 2016. Meanwhile, researchers at this pediatric hospital are beginning to conduct similar trials for children with cerebral palsy. 
How does it feel? It tickles and it feels weird. Anything else? This is 12-year-old Tia Morgan's first session of TDCS, also followed by a session of robotic therapy. So a child's brain, um, we know that the ability for it to mold is a lot greater. The brain is still forming at a very young age. There's still the ability to um, get it back to uh, its full usage as much as possible. That's what we're trying to do with the TDCS. Are you hopeful that something like transcranial direct current stimulation could be helpful to your daughter? It would help her do so many more things in life that she could do with the rest of the kids. We wouldn't have to you know, see the way she reacts or something, she, how she holds back. She could just be a normal kid like everybody else. Around the world, other studies for treating fibromyalgia pain, depression, and stroke-related aphasia with TDCS are moving forward. If you look at the, um, what's out there you know, for, for people who are depressed and people who suffer from intolerable pain, I mean, aside of drugs, there's nothing out there. If it continues to be like this, I'm sure this will make it to the market and this will help millions of people. So I'm definitely excited. We're seeing the early grains, you know, the early pieces of what TDCS can do. And that's why people are so excited, not just because what TDCS is able to do right now, proven in clinical trials, but the fact that we don't think we've seen anything yet. But it could be years before TDCS is approved by the FDA for treating medical conditions outside of clinical trials. Those in the DIY community, like Erica and Jeff, aren't willing to wait. Are you concerned at all about safety risks? In this society, we, we accept a certain amount of unknown. I don't think it's realistic to wait until we have a complete answer about whether there's any risk or what that risk actually looks like. I think the worst case scenario is it doesn't help as much as it seems to because people really want it to work. And there are lots of folks that are working through an injury or something like that where it may be half placebo and half work and realistically it's only doing half as much as you'd hope. The so-called do-it-yourself TDCS effort is not good for the advancement of the science or the medicine of TDCS. If someone were to hurt themselves doing something that really has little resemblance to what we do when we do TDCS, but they say they were hurt by TDCS, how will that reflect on us? Why would I want to do this at home? Why? <laughs> well, there's a growing movement of people who are interested in this brain hacking phenomenon, this kind of self-optimization phenomenon, wherein nothing's particularly wrong, but you want to have more concentration, better cognitive power. Yeah, cognitive enhancement is a big movement. Yeah, I mean, I'm still a bit skeptical about that, but I could see why it would catch on. So what is the difference between this type of therapy and something like electric shock therapy? So electroconvulsive therapy is still used in practice, mostly for clinical depression. The major difference between these two treatments is that ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, uses so much more electricity. It's a major shock to the brain that actually causes kind of total convulsions, and it has an effect on these depressive symptoms because of that. With TDCS, we're talking about minimal, minimal changes to the electricity of the brain that researchers think changes your ability to rewire. It changes your plasticity. Well, thank you, Kara. That was fascinating. I really can't wait to see the results of those studies. Now, coming up next, we're going from DIY brain hacking to DIY figuring out how long you're gonna live, <laughs> and it's using your cell phone. You guys think it's gonna work? I don't know. We'll find out after the break. Hey guys, welcome back to Techno. I'm Phil Torres, joined by Dr. Crystal Dilworth and Kara Santa Maria. So guys, figuring out how long you're gonna live is obviously a difficult but important question. Do you think a cell phone could help you figure it out? I'm skeptical, I gotta be honest. No, I don't think we're there yet. Well, our colleague Dr. Shinny Samara talked to two researchers who have an app that can maybe get us partway there. Let's take a look. Those telltale lines on our faces give a good indication of our age. But what if those signs of aging could also predict how long we're going to live? 
but we do know that people who look younger for their age tend to live longer. Using this premise, Dr. Jay Olshansky, an aging expert at the University of Illinois in Chicago, partnered with Dr. Carl Reiseneck, a computer science professor at the University of North Carolina. They created a program and website called Face My Age. And so the purpose of the website is to allow people to sort of upload their picture and then allow the algorithms to then tell them how old their face is. Not their chronological age, but their face age. And then with a few other pieces of information, it will spit out some information about lifespan and probabilities of reaching certain ages. And that's pretty useful. So some of my techno colleagues and I decided to face our ages. We took close-up selfies and uploaded them to the site for analysis. So in this image of your face, we're actually showing the points that we use to break up and parse the face. So these little white dots that you can barely see are points that we actually use in our algorithms find these points. The technology is based on facial recognition software. Dr. Carl has developed programs for both the FBI and Homeland Security. So starting from the top, we look at the forehead. We work our way down to the brows. Large pores or scaling is an indication of an older individual. And here we look at other aspects like marionette lines and the drooping of uh, the ends of the mouth, wow. which are all indicators of uh, age we actually got an age of 35. All right. Spot on. Your life expectancy was 84, which is a pretty good life pretty expectancy. Good innings. Next up, our host, Phil Torres. So this is my selfie. What can you tell me about my future? Going down, we look at the forehead, and this is some indication that possibly you spend some time out in the sun because you have some creasing here, but you don't see that in any other parts of your face. So in essence, this is a fairly young face. So if we were to put this into the software, what would happen? If we try to put this in the software, we'll run into some problems relative to the facial hair. Well, first off, it throws off the alignment, and second, it does cover up inf information. So what you're saying is I took a selfie for science, but it wasn't enough. I also need to shave for Yeah, science. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. pushing it, I don't know. Since Phil isn't willing to lose the beard, we asked correspondent Crystal Dilworth to submit a selfie. So let's see what the algorithm says. Are you ready? I'm a little scared, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> All right. Wow. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> so how old are you? I am 31. All right, and we say 28, and, and we give you some other uh, data relative to expected lifespan and probability of living past uh, 65 and 85. It's actually Both pretty good. Both of those good. are over 50%. Yeah, that's really good. It's a lot better than mine. Is it? <laughs> yeah. The longevity prediction is currently based on a short questionnaire that asks questions like, do you smoke? And what's your level of education? All factors that doctors say affect how long we live. Right now, we have not linked the face age to the longevity. That's a component of research that we have planned for the next couple of years. And think of it this way, the way it will work is, let's say you're 30 and your face age comes in at 25. What we're trying to do is find out how that five-year reduction in face age translates into extended longevity. And on a more personal level, doctors hope being able to get a longevity prediction may inspire people to make healthier life choices. In terms of accuracy, I'm skeptical, but it's a lot of fun. I showed up to the office <laughs> that day and had my face scanned. It said that I was 50. <laughs> now, please, dear God, tell me that I don't look 50. You don't. You don't. So what do you think the lip ring did? Right, I mean, this is not a typical part of somebody's facial anatomy. It probably did throw it off a bit. I'm not sure why a lip ring would make me look 50, but we'll, we'll say it was the lip ring and not my actual face. And I'll tell you what, when I tweeted about face my age, I got more responses from people trying it at home than I have on any other shoot. And some people say it nailed it, other people said it didn't really work. Well, really fascinating stuff today, guys. I think you can see how science in the lab can be very different from doing science at home. And, you know, science at home can be incredibly useful. Things like citizen science projects, but when it comes to things like zapping your brain or medical diagnostics, perhaps you want to be a little bit more cautious. Yeah, I'm Agreed. not sure you want to try it at home. Yeah.
and we'll bring you more good stuff in the field of science next week here on Techno. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Google+, and more.